Howdy, everybody. Okay, we have a new topic here, topic six, uh, documentation and warnings. Uh, so let's start it off. Uh, so there's actually four, there's four parts to this, uh, um, this topic. Uh, we're going to talk about how do people read in general, uh, and how do you design reading material for humans, and then eventually we're going to get to the design of really critical uh, verbal ways of communicate verbal and nonverbal, I guess, ways of communicating uh, important things like hazards in the design of um, of, of hazard dis um, hazard warning displays. All right. So first, uh, 6.1, written information processing. OK, uh, so I like to start it off, um, you know, uh, this topic here by uh, giving a nod to uh, one of my favorite uh, forefathers of the human factors world. This is Alphonse Chapanis, and uh, he has a very famous uh, keynote address given as part of his. Uh, he, he was uh, one of the presidents of the Human Factors and Ergonomics Society and gave this really is one of my favorite um, uh, historical human factors pieces to work with. Uh, but it's an article that's called Words, Words, Words. The article was basically uh, written after his keynote speech. They said, you know, I guess they said, hey, that was so good. Uh, give us some more, write it down. So yes, Dr. Japanis here says, in my opinion, one of the most pressing problems in human engineering today, this was 1965 when he said this roughly, uh, but still today, uh, one of the most pressing problems is the need to human engineer the literature of our field. Okay, there he is. Uh, so written uh, language, uh, I want you to think of written language as a tool for interfacing with a human, right? So humans in a complex system, how do we get information in? A lot of times it's verbal. It uses a, a language, you know, not always English, of course, uh, not always uh, written, could be verbal, could be visual, could be body language, for example. But the methods by which we define as a people, um, these utterances or these symbols convey meaning. That tool of language is used as our interface for passing information to and from other humans. So think of, of that, you know, that interfacing, that system sort of perspective on this. Uh, um, we can interface with humans to communicate how technology is to be used. Instruction manuals, for example, procedure manuals. Um, and of course, we can communicate human to human through this tool of language. Okay, so if we are writing uh, a message that is to be received by other humans, we have to think about the audience we're designing for. Uh, and so we have a wide spectrum of abilities to receive the information that might be coded in a language. So of course we have moments in everybody's lives when we are developing language and we still need to be able to interface with humans who are developing that language so we got to think what you know what words can be understood by our target audience here um the target audience that you interact with most days are people like this and what i mean by that is the high end of very intelligent adult people. <laughs> uh, so you may not realize this uh, every day, but being at a top 10 engineering institution means your peers, the people sitting next to you, um, you know, whether you're, you know, at work or, or at school, uh, uh, you know, in, in class, you're surrounded by people that are smarter than the average person. I want to say average American, but it's the average human. Uh, and maybe smart isn't the right term, but at least in terms of linguistic skill, in terms of familiarity with a, a particular language, you've got the spectrum here. You've got all kinds of people from the low end to the high end that you maybe have to consider. I'm writing for them. It's a very different experience for me to write a note for my young children. They're not young anymore, I guess, but for children versus for my, you know, my undergrad and graduate students working with me in the lab. Uh, so I have a very different uh, uh, language set, I, I suppose I might use with them. So this is for the United States, and I would uh, expect that this is a fairly common um, sort of pattern that you could project worldwide. Um, but the literacy of the average American is actually maybe lower than you would expect. 
Um, and so this is, uh, you know, mapping how, how they measure literacy. And here's our bell curve in the United States. And if we draw the mean line, it's basically between a seventh, seventh grade and an eighth grade reading level in the US educational system. And if you look across all these states, and this is, uh, you know, fairly recent data, you know, last five to 10 years, um, you know, there are a lot of states, you know, in the south here, we're we're in this big orange one here, uh, where is significant a quarter to, you know, a third of the population, uh, you know, reads at a fifth grade level or lower. Now, fifth grade reading is reading. But what does it mean if I want to use terms like, you know, cognitive ergonomics and, and hopefully, you know, make that make sense? Um, maybe that's a little higher than, you know, the uh, the average American's reading level. So we need to consider that. And when we design things for humans, we don't design things for only smart humans going to top 10 engineering institutions. We design for the human population and all of their abilities, right? Okay, so uh, when we talk about reading, we want to uh, talk about two influences that affect how people process written information. Bottom-up influences, and I've got that on this slide, and top-down influences. So we'll start here, bottom-up influences. You may hear me refer to this term. In fact, you've heard me speak this term in this class before with regard to displays, at least, at least the topic of displays. Um, but bottom-up influences and how we process information starts with the physical world and the physical energies of the world that are available to our senses. So all of these patterns of you know, electromagnetic radiation that reach my retina, um, these are the raw building blocks from the physical environment entering into my information processing computer that is my eyes and brain. Uh, so the bottom-up influences, this is coming from the environment, coming into my brain, from the bottom to the top, I guess, um, are, um, are uh, ways that we select um, uh, a sensory stimuli and combine them uh, in order to come up with a full perception, a full image. So these patterns of light and their arrangement then get structured. Okay, here's how they connect. Here's foreground and background aspects. And then eventually we see, oh, that's a horse. Um, but to follow that, the influence, it starts at that raw sensory level, okay? So we have to think about things that are that play well with our raw sensory processing. And one term I really want you to know, ring ring for the for the midterm, is salient. How salient is something? This is a term I, I refer to in almost all my classes and say, hey, this is an important term. This term to me, or at least for this class, means how much does something stand out from the background? So in terms of my sorting of my sensory data to determine this is foreground and stuff I want to pay attention to, stuff I want to extract information from, versus this is background, These this is noise, I don't need to, you know, devote my precious sensory processing resources to it. So how do I select that? Well, one of the rules that I use is how much does it stick out by itself? So how loud is a sound? How bright is an image? Or, you know, how dark is an image amongst a very bright background. So how much, how different is it is, is a different question than how intense is it, right? Or how, you know, how, how, how much illumination is there? Um, I could have a salient thing if I'm looking at a white screen and I have a dark square or a dark image in the middle of it. That's salient also, stands out from the background. Okay, so that property of salience, how much does our sensory receptors pick that out? Um, you know, how, how, how attractive is it to the way that our senses work? Bottom-up influence. On the other side, our top-down influences come from within. So while bottom-up is the exterior environment, how salient are these things? How much physical energy is in them, according to things that my senses can process? Top-down influences come from my memory, my experience, my, my expectations, my goals, 
Uh, and so as this girl here is viewing this pattern of light, she also brings into that perception her history of everything that is horse-like and associated with horses, you know? So maybe this is her remembering that one time in summer camp when she rode a horse, you know, into a tree or whatever, or maybe this was um, I went to the Houston rodeo last year. I saw the movie, you know, Nope, that was, was a very good movie. Uh, I'm, I'm watching this cartoon, for example, you know, all of the world of hoarseness that exists in this woman's, this young, young woman's brain, uh, she brings with her into her perceptual experience. And she's matching up the pattern of light that strikes her retina and is organized in her visual cortex with these previous life experiences as she's interpreting that sensory data. So we always have both types of influences anytime we perceive anything. There's the physical world, you know, that brings its sensory data or it brings its data to our senses. And there's our internal expectations that help us and, and goals and motivations, et cetera, that help us interpret that sensory input. And together they create our perception of that's a horse. And everything I think about with hoarseness uh, comes with that perception. Okay, so if we talk about reading, we can really emphasize these two types of influences and talk about design factors that make them work well with humans. So in terms of bottom up influences or bottom up processing with reading, it kind of goes like this. So oops. So first I see some edges. Okay, I see uh, two uh, uh, diagonal edges and a ver and a horizontal line. And I am taking those raw sensory data and building them together. Oh, they go together in this context. That's an A. That's something I maybe recognize. And then I see that A in a broader context of a word. And then I see that word in a broader context of a phrase. And ultimately, I understand the whole textbook. Um, but it starts with recognizing that, hey, there, there are these contours and line elements that when assembled together in a certain arrangement have a meaning and then that meaning is embedded in a broader meaning and it gets you know more and more um, um more and more towards your experience and less and less towards the raw sensory input top-down processing is a little easier maybe more fun to to kind of give examples of um, because if you think about all right as i'm viewing this horse and i'm taking into account everything in my life experience that exists in my brain that goes with hoarseness. Uh, the context under which I'm perceiving this horse uh, is going to influence how I, how I actually perceive it. Uh, and so if we're talking about words, right? So things like, well, when am I going to view this combination of contours arranged in just a certain way? It's going to be impacted by my top-down influences, my expectations, because maybe I'm sitting in a class talking about human factors, then when I read the term human factors, that has a different meaning, you know, than somebody who's never taken a class, you know, in this, in this, in this style. Uh, so um, on a simpler level, if we look at this, uh, what I see here is an ambiguous symbol. Uh, this is something that from a bottom up perspective, I have no problems processing it, I can see the shape, I can see the orientation of the raw elements. I can see how they're connected. I am having a hard time interpreting it, though, because I'm missing the context in which I might see this symbol. Um, so here's the context. And I'm also showing you kind of multiple contexts at once, right? So I have the same symbol. And here, as I read it, I look at T-H-E. I see it as the. And I see this as cat. Even though it's the same symbol, it gets interpreted two different ways based on the context in which it's situated. It is entirely possible that this phrase says tay chit. <laughs> it's entirely feasible. It's just as, you know, just as valid if you look at just the bottom up features. Um, but contextually, I know that the is a common word, cat is a common word. So I'm going to use that contextual information in interpreting this. And I see the cat. I don't see T ambiguous symbol E, C ambiguous symbol T. I read the whole context, right? Uh, similarly, turn her at, Ma at Main Street. I'm sure it didn't take you too long to think, oh, 
this must mean right. Um, even though I gave you a, an ambiguous, a degraded sense, you know, set of stimuli. Um, interesting. This jumbled sentence is readable. If you look at that, none of those words, oh, other than is, I guess, are spelled correctly. And you want to take that to more extreme. See if you can read this. I'll not talk with, so you can read it yourself. I hope you can read that. If you can't join me in office hours, I'll read it to you. Uh, but I hope what you see here, this example is how powerful the context, our previous experience with things like prosody and language, you know, um, where we would expect certain words to be, um, those expectations guide us so that when those words are there, like the word at or, or, or the, right, that they're that much more quickly processed because we're already guided with our expectations. And when they match our sensory input, it can be a, um, you know, it can be a, a complete perception. So just a couple of tricks here with this one. Obviously, we're not uh, trying to trick people when we're designing readable things, but this shows the power of expectations, you know, of top down influences that people would bring into a visual experience. Uh, oh, yes. So look at this and see what you think. When people think they understand the context of a message, it is common for them to be caught. What? What do you think? Um, because it's this is just nonsense. There's nothing written there. That's interesting. Okay. Uh, if Okay. Jumping to conclusions. I hope you see it that way. That was my intended uh, misleading the context here makes us think that would make sense as a completion to the sentence. The bottom up input is ambiguous. And if I am tricking you and the bottom up input is actually, you know, something different and I've obscured it, then this can kind of show you how powerful that influence is. All right. <clears throat> Good. So we've seen some of these before. I mentioned already, yep, in the displays lecture. So right there at the top, from topic four displays, uh, we have some references to making displays that work with how humans process information and from a bottom-up perspective. So perceptual principle number one, making displays legible slash audible. This is essentially saying make the bottom-up influences sufficient to reach our senses right, to be processed by our sensory channels. So the contrast of visual things, how large is it, how illuminated is it? Uh, when we talk about hearing a noise in a, ooh, that's next week, actually, that's that's topic seven, um, you will hear more about ways to make audible signals, you know, auditory signals more um, perceivable. Uh, also avoiding absolute judgment. Humans are not that great in an absolute sense at differentiating more than five to seven items. Uh, and so this, you know, generally across our senses. And so if you want something to stand out from the background to be salient, and therefore work with our bottom up information processing mechanisms, then, you know, this is a good perceptual principle to follow with um, for, for displays. So don't don't push people to be able to distinguish more than five to seven things in an absolute sense. And the top down influences, there's actually a perceptual principle called top down processing. So that's pretty straightforward. And you may remember this one was about how people develop expectations. And so then while I'm reading something like a checklist, I can overlook things maybe because of my expectations might drive me to pay a little bit less attention to the actual characters I'm looking at. I go a little bit more with, you know, leaning on my expectations and, and um, you know, um, uh, uh, my interpretations as I'm going with something. So we need to have more bottom-up influence. That's what I'm showing you here. This do should be off, I'm making those two aspects of this wording more salient by making it larger and changing the color. So I'm really amping up the bottom up influence to overcome the potential for the top down influence to make me, you know, make a mistake to, to read something incorrectly. Okay, good. So that's call back to your displays topic. Oh, sorry about my animation here. It's a little weird. Uh, but uh, we have two different types of literature that we can talk about in this class, since my animation's all goofy. 
Uh, are we talking about instructions? I'm trying to convey, you know, material to somebody who has to follow instructions, you know, because they're doing a job or because it's safety critical or whatever. We really want to emphasize more so in this case, those bottom up influences popping out and capturing attention when you can, making sure people get the full message by guiding them to, you know, the most relevant aspects of the information. So random strings, you know, I'm reading a list of instructions I've never read before. Um, there are, you know, part numbers in there that don't mean anything to me, for example, or other other words that I'm I'm not very familiar with. This is where you really want to emphasize those um, bottom-up influences to make the senses work for you as best as possible. Um, yes, yeah, so the key function here for bottom-up sorts of literature is capturing and guiding attention to the right places, like warning signs, right? So yeah, here's a big hazard. Here's a big thing you really got to know as you are using this, you know, tool that has safety implications. All right, now right side of the slide here, if I am reading some, some magazines, if I'm reading for pleasure, if I'm reading literature to enjoy myself and not necessarily super important that I get this message conveyed to me verbatim as it is without missing any details, now we can rely more so on people's interests, motivations, goals, experiences, the things that already exist in their head. So greater top-down sorts of influences. I'm, I'm very familiar with this topic. That's why I'm reading about it in my magazine. Um, and so this is where you can play with people's previous knowledge, their expectation a lot more. So you can rely a lot more on what people are bringing into the reading experience than you can with you know more drier instructional material. Um, there we go. So the key here is clarity of the message. This is going to depend on knowing your audience more, more than anything. Understand the audience's background, expectations, and the context. Are they reading this in a doctor's office? Are they reading it on a plane? You know, are they reading it at home, you know, like next to the fire? All of those matter for how you might design this reading material to be effectively conveying your message in those contexts. Okay, so uh, obviously, like I said, every time humans read anything, both of these influences are at play. You must have something that reaches your senses and something in your brain to match up with your sensory input, uh, you know, so bottom up to the senses, top down from the brain, and both of those must be there to have a coherent perception. Uh, and so we want to support both of those influences in our design of documentation of, of material that's designed to, you know, statically convey information to people. Uh, in a bottom-up sense, capital letters, health warning, are great for capturing attention because they are more salient most of the time. Unless you're somebody who uses caps lock all the time on your tweets, let's just say people out there exist. Uh, in that case, it doesn't stand out when it's capital letters because everything is capital letters. So it's really about capitalizing sparingly because this is how you draw attention to key important, you know, words and phrases, health warning right at the top, no smoking, right? Um, I'm also using color coding, right? And so I'm drawing attention, large, colorful, high contrast uh, items. This is a, you know, stands out from the background kind of salience here. Um, also, I have to understand these messages. I have to understand the iconography here beyond the, um, you know, beyond the wording. Um, I got to understand these symbols. I, I think I understand this one, but I don't know what's going on with these exactly. Is this don't touch a seashell? I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, so I have to be able to interpret things based on my past experience top down um, and, you know, for symbols as well as it needs to capture my attention when I need my attention to go to important things. All right, so words, if I'm talking about just text here, the capital letters, great for attracting attention, as long as it's not all capital letters everywhere, because then it doesn't stand out. And if you want to convey a more, you know, um, let's just say like a detailed message, Use mixed case. Here you go. Mixed cases like this, some capital, some lowercase. This is a good example. Mixed case, uh, because that's actually easier 
for the human visual system to process verbally. So there's a number of reasons for that, but mixed cases give you more, give humans more clues to work with when they're interpreting a word than all caps because the shape differences are more pronounced with mixed case. And that and that matters for how we interpret some symbol. Um, you know, the mixed case tells us at least, hey, this is in the middle of a sentence or a middle of a word as opposed to, you know, it, it's easier for us to visually uh, pick up on patterns for whole words as well. All right, good, good, good. Um, if you are, you know, designing to support both, which one do we lean more so on? It should depend largely in how are these, uh, uh, you know, these artifacts, these instruments designed to be viewed. This license plate designed to be viewed probably, you know, in passing, you know, hey, somebody just committed a crime, I need to get that plate or, or whatever. Um, and so we, we don't need a whole lot of prose, you know, I'm not reading a whole bunch here. It can be short words, Arizona, you know, one word there, I guess Grand Canyon State, multiple words, but um, the idea here is let's emphasize the salience because this already doesn't mean much to most people, this sequence of, of numbers and letters. It does have a meaning. And in order for us to be able to process it and remember it and use it, let's make it real salient. So capital letters, bold, et cetera. Uh, if I need a clear communication of, I really need to convey what you do when a mountain lion approaches you, Let's use mixed case. Let's use, you know, um, sentences that are detailed that, you know, they obviously have to flow right. They have to be well written, um, but they're going to be easier to work with than, um, you know, just just screaming at somebody in all caps. Uh, so here you go. This is, you know, written, you know, it's it's short to the point, relatively concise, but detailed, I suppose. Uh, and so, yeah, you can you can get the point there with each type of reading. And I'll end this first part on just an example I'd like you to think about. Ooh, maybe I ask about this in a midterm, for example. It'd be a good idea. Uh, look at each of these two examples of boarding passes and think about these two properties. Um, the bottom-up influences, how well do, do I attract attention to important aspects? I don't know if you would uh, agree with me, but this guy's face here is attracting a lot of my attention but it doesn't carry a whole lot of information that I might use if I'm this guy down here, right? I'm running to my gate. Oh, crap. Which gate? Oh, I'm looking at this thing. I, I can't see where, where's my gate. Where's my gate? I see the guy he's smiling, you know, that bottom up influence is there. Um, but where do I, where is it? There it is. Great. Gate 002. It takes me a bit, right? Uh, how long does it take me to find the important things is indicative of the quality of this tool for conveying information to me, a human, right? Or to this guy, a human, right? Um, so, hey, where am I going? You know, which which one, you know, I, I'm always, you know, if I fly out of College Station, I almost always have a College Station to Dallas and then Dallas to X. I've got two boarding passes with me and believe me, I get those mixed up all the time and I'm in line and okay, well, which one? And I, it's going to take me a few seconds to figure out which one and it shouldn't, you know? This is something I know exactly what I'm looking for. There's only so many things on this piece of paper that I have with me. Um, I should be able to find what I need more readily. Uh, so thought experiment for now, but possible future exam example or, or question, thinking about how each of these effectively and ineffectively make use of bottom-up and top-down design, uh, uh, design influences here. Okay. Thanks. Tune in for 16.2.